So welcome back. So we are moving into uh, chapter three of the Vamalakarti Sutra tonight, um, the day after the what was it blue moon, blood moon, super moon, lunar eclipse, everything together. Um, so of course, it's a good time to do the the moon disc meditation, um, and I believe um, actually in Seattle the night of the full moon they were able to do it um, the real full moon meditations they go out outside do the meditation um, I think at Green Lake so one of the other problems that we have here is that um, by the time the moon is up Mount Hood is blocking it <laughs> so you have to wait until much later uh, so then it gets a little bit kind of late for here but over there because you can look out over the lake you have a much better perspective um, so the bowl that Portland is in uh, doesn't lend itself too well uh, to moon viewing. So we might have to go out to Eastern Oregon or something at some point and do the uh, moon disk meditation in using the real moon. So um, the Vamalakirti Sutra continues and now having uh, been introduced to our uh, the main character, the title character of the sutra, we start to meet some of the other disciples of the Buddha. And at this point, we've learned that Vamalakirti is taken ill, or as we learned in the last chapter, he's manifesting an illness. Um, and now he thought to himself, hmm, I wonder why the Buddha hasn't come to call on me. Why hasn't he come to see how I'm doing, knowing that I'm sick? So uh, Vamalakirti, um, it starts off at this time, the elder Vamalakirti thought to himself, I am lying sick in bed. How can the world honor one? He of great sympathy not take pity on me. So it's an interesting question. Um, first, we would think, well, if he's so wise, why does he need anyone to come check on him? <laughs> Especially since he's manifesting the illness. He's not actually ill. Um, and then, isn't this kind of a you know rude thought to some way? So actually, this this thought functions as the request for the Dharma. So normally, a sutra starts. Um, at some level of someone asking a question. So this is the question. I've manifested this illness. The Buddha has great sympathy. Why hasn't he come to visit? So it doesn't function as the Vimalakirti questioning the Buddha, um, his motives or something. It functions as the actual request. This is the question. So in response, the Buddha knowing that Vimalakirti has this question, um, because to some degree they're both in on the this inside joke, <laughs> that Pamalakirti has manifested this illness. Um, the Buddha then starts to ask many of his top disciples who will go in his place to check on Pamalakirti, who shall, shall he send. So there's obviously some, um, you could say, uh, ancient Indian custom here that if someone takes ill, you know, how do you check on them? Do you go visit them? still have this custom, if you hear someone's gotten sick, you go visit them um, or, or see them. But here we have you know, a teacher and they're sending uh, students. So this is something we may not, uh, probably didn't run into in school. Your college professor or high school teacher didn't say, one of my friends is sick, won't you go check on him? So um, it has a bit of uh, uh, multiple layers here. So what's really happening is Malakirti has this great wisdom and insight, so does the Buddha. And this is functioning as a way to challenge the students. So who's actually going to go? So it's a teaching device, of course, like most everything else is in Sutra. And like a good teacher, um, the teacher here is pushing the students outside their comfort zone for a greater good. It's not, uh, of course, the Buddha already knows that many of them are uncomfortable. He knows who's best suited to go check on Vamalakirti, but he's going to ask one by one, you know, would you go? Would you go? And then why not? Why? What are your What are your blockages? So there's etiquette. There's getting feedback from the students of what their difficult issues are, and there's also this you know despite this trepidation, kind of pushing the students out. So it's sort of mama bird pushing the baby birds out of the nest. They're not sure if they can fly, uh, but there's only one way to find out. So this is the function of the request. 
So the sutra goes on and says, Knowing that Vamalakirti was thinking, the Buddha immediately told Sariputra, Go visit Vamalakirti and inquire about his illness. Sariputra addressed the Buddha, World Honored One, I dare not accept your instruction to go inquire about his illness. Why? I remember once in the past when I was sitting in repose beneath a tree. At that time, Vamalakirti came and said to me, Sariputra, you need not take the sitting in meditation to be sitting in repose. Sitting in repose is not to manifest body and mind in the triple world. This is sitting in repose. To generate the concentration of extinction while manifesting the deportments, this is sitting in repose. Not to relinquish the dharma of enlightenment and yet manifest the affairs of ordinary sentient beings, this is sitting in repose. To have the mind neither abide internally nor locate itself externally, this is sitting in repose. To be unmoved by the 62 mistaken views, yet cultivate the 37 factors of enlightenment, this is sitting in repose. Not to, to uh, eradicate the afflictions, yet enter into nirvana, this is sitting in repose. Those who are able to sit in this fashion will receive the Buddha's seal of approval. So, here's Sariputra, sitting marvelously under the tree, and Vamalakirti almost comes and sort of heckles him. <laughs> you're sitting in repose? No, this is not sitting in repose. Let me tell you all the things you're doing wrong. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. This is the right way. Um, so Sariputra's like, I don't want to go see that guy. The last time I ran into him, he made me feel like this big. <laughs> so um, we're going to see this formula play out again and again where uh, the Buddha asks the disciple to go and they all have a story about their encounters with Vamalakirti. So Vamalakirti um, is pesky could say um, he shows up at probably from the student's perspective the wrong time you know here I am it's a beautiful day I'm meditating under the tree you know this is India too right so it's, it's tropical it's nice it's warm it's not like today it was kind of cold and windy and wet and off and on um, you know it's just like oh you know and then you're going to be criticized on on your meditation um, so to be criticized is never generally fun but it's helpful to think of this as constructive criticism. This isn't criticism just to point out errors and score points. So it's a completely different type of commentary. Um, and the Buddha's students, their refusals aren't angry ones. They're not, I'm not going. No, you can't make me. It's a very thoughtful um, thing. They've remembered in depth what Vamalakirti had to say. Um, and the reason they're refusing isn't a fear of being heckled or criticized again. It's at this point, um, having been at the assembly, being by the Buddha side, knowing who Vimalakirti is and his wisdom, they know that he's everything's a teachable moment, right? Every single thing that he says, anytime you engage him, it isn't a kind of to tear you down, it's to it's an opportunity for the teaching. So they feel unworthy to engage in a uh, conversation with him for fear of not holding up their side of the conversation. Um, so it's, um, sometimes I listen to philosophy talk on NPR. <laughs> have you ever listened to this show? So you have two philosophers and they're talking and they're asking questions of the guest. And you know, of course, because they're both professors of philosophy at Harvard or something that they know the answers to their questions, but they're asking the questions so the audience benefits from the speaker and that they gain something from the conversation. Because it may be that the topic they're discussing is just a little bit too high above the audience. The audience doesn't have sufficient background. So they ask the questions so that the audience can follow along. So the disciples here are saying, you know, we know this is gonna happen. I can't keep up my end of the conversation. <laughs> I'm not going to be good for everyone else who's present to really get the most out of the conversation with Vimalakirti, send someone else. So it's a very thoughtful, um, and in fact, their refusal is compassionate as well. It's not a, uh, like mine would be, like, oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> yeah, he's going to debate me into the ground, but that's okay. Um, so first, Vimalakirti's... Um, what does he point out about Sariputra? So he points out the sitting in repose. So he's suggesting that the motivation for Vamalakirti's meditation is wrong. So this is really what he's getting at. That Vamalakirti has found a nice spot off in the forest, probably the beautiful, most well-formed tree with the softest grass and leaves underneath. And he's sitting there just like, 
Ah, oh, I'm on vacation. <laughs> this is great. Ah, oh, I feel so good. Uh, I've, you know, left behind the stink of the city and the hustle and bustle and the bus fumes. Oh, well, ox fumes. <laughs> um, you know, oh, this is wonderful. I, I've gotten away from it all. And so Vimala Kirti is really pointing out your motivation for this is wrong. That you appear to be doing Buddhist meditation, but in fact, you're just engaging in this sort of escapism. So you're not really engaged, right? You're looking only for your own... Uh, salvation, you're not giving any thought to um, the needs of others, which in fact is an underlying um, motivation for the Vamalakirti manifesting this illness and drawing people near is so that other people who will hear the conversation can benefit. Right? It's all this very compassionate farce <laughs> to teach people, to, to transform them. So if you only go off in the forest, only to transform yourself and you never give any thought and you're like you've run away and you're like oh finally here i can meditate right this place is free of all those distractions then um that's what vimalakirti is pointing out now we may say well monasteries are in the mountains in quiet places is that wrong uh no it's vimalakirti saying to sariputra at your level right at this point in your development at this point you should have gotten past that already you should be far enough along down the road that you don't need to still go somewhere to look for a lack of distractions. You should be able to do this anywhere, right? So it says in part of the text, um, not to relinquish the Dharma of enlightenment yet manifest the affairs of ordinary sentient beings, right? You should be able to practice in the midst of your daily life. We see you at the store buying new sandals, you should still be in repose, right? That should be a meditative exercise for you at this point. Sariputra, right? So it's a very focused uh, critique to Sariputra. In fact, there are words to make him wake up, to say, you haven't gone far enough, you can go further, you have more potential. Don't get stuck at this level. Now, for the initial student, yes, it's very nice to go to the monastery in the mountains and there's less distractions, but there's also more challenges. It's not a spa, right? That's what many people think. Um, it's hard. The conditions are hard, right? There's no heat, there's no air conditioning. <laughs> This food is very simple. Um, there's hard work, so it's very different. And you will, will you know, dream of the city and the creature comforts. Um, so it's not, you know, what it may, is made out to be. Is it beautiful? Oh yeah, absolutely. But there's a lot of work to keep it looking beautiful. Right? If you go to the temple and you see the beautiful garden, it takes a lot of work. Um, I can tell you stories, but <laughs> another night. So, um, so what? What is, um, what's the real frustration? So, you know, generally for us, we say we work, 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 and we get sort of filled up with stress and worry, and then we need a vacation. And we think the vacation is going to fix us. And what Vimalakirti is pointing out is if we have that idea, then we're constantly needing to escape, like Sariputra. Or we progress to a point where everything, you know, we just flow through situations and we're not sort of picking up all of the detritus of stress and, and worry and, you know, it's not just building up on us. So there is another way. So at some point, that is what Sariputra should be able to do. And I think Vimalakirti is saying to him, by this point, especially being one of the Buddha's chief disciples, you're the right-hand man. Right, you have you're exposed to more teaching, you have more opportunity to practice than probably anyone. Shouldn't you be further down the road? So that's that's the point. And this was classically Sariputra's uh, obstacle um, throughout, uh, even even after the Buddha's entry into Nirvana, he was going around teaching, having heard more of the teaching, and people were saying, "Yet you still haven't gotten there yourself." Right? There's just a little bit left. You're still hung up on the form or you have to do it a certain way or doing it in a certain place. You can't just do your practice all the time. Um, so sometimes the motivation still needed to be addressed. So this is Vimalakirti's critique. Um, and that's also, I think, the, the background teaching. If there is another way for us to right, view this practice. Right? It's not for, not only as a, you know, a break from the hustle and bustle, do we need a break from the hustle and bustle? Yes. Don't worry. <laughs> that part's still there. So, um, 
The Malakirti makes several points. So it says the first one is not manifesting body and mind in the triple world. So here he's talking about truly overcoming duality. Um, that one of Sariputra's issues or hang-ups is that we somehow have to run away from the secular material world and go off to this special, holy, pure place to do practice. And Vamalakirti says, if you have this idea, this dichotomy in mind, you're going to get stuck. That's just another hurdle, right? There is no pure place. There is no, you know, ultimately better place here, right? Any place in the world of form still has its problems. Um, any place that a, humans gather, there's still going to be drama and politics. You can't escape it, even if it appears from the outside to be this beautiful, glittering, you know, wonderful place. There's always, there's always something. You know, you may think you work for the, I work for this wonderful nonprofit and we have this great mission and yet there's office politics, <laughs> yet there's some drama, right? There's something. So um, everyone can watch office space and go, yes, there's something in there that's the truth, no matter how great my workplace is, right? Um, so if we're attached to these ideas that, you know, there's some place to abandon and something to run off to, then, then that's a hurdle. So the second thing Vimalakirti points out to Sariputra is generating the concentration of extinction while manifesting the deportments. So this is common anytime we discuss religion, that a religion will say XYZ is bad, XYZ over here is better. Um, you should abandon XYZ, stop doing this and that, and start doing this thing. Uh, so if we have this very kind of set, you know, well, if you want to be a seeker or a religious person or whatever, then you can't do these things. That it sets up this judgmental aspect in mind. And instead, um, what, well, what Vimalakirti is pointing out here is that if Sariputra thinks this way, it's because Sariputra can't control himself. Right? So, example, modern times. Um, we have a, we're in the Me Too movement. We're in a, a like, social awareness of uh, people's actions towards each other. And one, a long time response from society is to focus on what women do and what women wear, which basically says that men can't control themselves. <laughs> right? So this is the Malakirti saying kind of the same thing, that if you think the problem is that you need to remove the temptations, that means you have no control. That you actually just need to work on yourself so that you don't see these things as temptations. That you're not seeing them or you don't have that weakness, right? If you have the control, it doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't matter how someone's dressed. You're not going to just explode or lose your control. So this is Vimalakirti's kind of very specific critique on Shariputra. That you're still going off to some place that you deem pure or peaceful because, in fact, you can't control yourself, right? So, you know, there's two ways to diet. One... Go someplace where there's no food that's going to make you fat. <laughs> or have, you know, build the willpower to just not eat those things, even if you see them. Because there is no place, really, that's free of food that's not healthy, right? There's, that place doesn't exist. North Korea. Well, maybe North Korea. <laughs> or Venezuela right now, right? Everybody's getting thin because there's not enough to eat. Um, but generally, right, the, the, you can't run away from the problems or cover them up and say, well, oh, okay, now I'm, I'm safe. Right? That's, just, that's not a good way to view it. You can't you know, prescribe the world, put rules in the world and say, well, if you dress this way, then I won't be, I'll have more control. If you take these temptations away, then I'll have control. We, we have to work on ourselves. So this is um pointed critique of that kind of thinking. So it goes on, uh, let's see, the third, not relinquishing the Dharma of enlightenment and yet manifesting the affairs of ordinary sentient beings. So um, here it's really not giving up a practice that leads towards enlightenment. It's a focus on, are you only focused on yourself or does your practice have some focus on others, on society, on helping other people? But really it's about practicing equanimity. So if Sariputra is running off to some place that uh, has less distractions, that means to some degree that he's trying to surround himself with people that are not going to be detrimental to what he thinks is the right way. Right? So um, that also is sort of 
false narrative. That's not going to help you. Then the, immediately when you're surrounded by people that you don't think are worthy, you start to treat them differently. You start to think, you know, well, you're not helping me. You become frustrated. Um, you know, you're not good for my practice. Kind of, you know, I can't be around you. So Buddhism doesn't have this idea, right? There's no, um, you know, leave your non-Buddhist friends and only spend time with your Buddhist friends. That's just, that's crazy. So uh, here the practice is, you know, pure equanimity. Can you begin to see everyone as equal, right? The people that you think are annoying you are actually an opportunity for you to practice, right? Can you actually practice equanimity with them? The people that, you know, are helping support your practice more directly, you know, maybe good and wise spiritual advisors, then you say, can I live up to their model, right? So you're always challenging yourself. You can't go to this false, you know, this utopia of, of practice space, right? That's not, uh, that's not beneficial. It's not real practice. Right? As soon as you leave that, your practice falls apart. So this is one of Amalakirti's kind of pointed um, critiques. Um, it's also, I think, a pointed critique at anyone engage seriously in spiritual practice, right? So here's Sariputra, the monk, and yet his compassion is limited because he constantly wants to run away from distractions. So um, it's about this sort of authenticity with regard to his spiritual practice all the time. Right? So the fourth one. So it says to have a mind neither abide internally nor locate itself externally. Um, it's talking about where do we get hung up? We get hung up in our sense organs. We get very hung up um, on taste, smell, touch, feeling, all these different things. Watch a commercial. And it's going to talk to you about all the different sensory perceptions that you know, especially laundry detergent. <laughs> right? It's all like people grabbing things, and then they're rubbing the towel. <laughs> it's very primal, right? It's like, oh, I, I expect the people to turn into cats and just start purring, you know, <laughs> really take it out of the dryer. And then, then they get this image of like they're spinning in a field of fresh wildflowers. And like, that's how wonderful the dryer sheets make you feel. Um, Nothing ever says, you know, cleans your stuff good, right? And then it goes on. No, it's got to, it evokes all of these, this, these images. So um, are we abiding only externally or can we actually um, not be totally reliant and sort of mm, addicted to constant sensory input? So this is one of Vamalakirti's cautions. So the fifth, to be unmoved by the 62 mistaken views, yet cultivate the 37 factors of enlightenment. So I'm not going to go through all 62, so we won't have to be here all night. However, um, <laughs> we expect nothing less. Right? Go through that one. Um, Short changed. <laughs> another night. I'll, I'll give you the list. So, um, so basically it says these are divisive views. So... You can think of it as there's sort of two extremes. You have the extreme of eternalism and the extreme of nihilism. And you have everything in between. And Buddhism is always called the middle way because it is somewhere between those two. Um, and you have a long spectrum, right, of thought, process, ideas, philosophies that lean one side or the other. So um, I guess maybe politically, Buddhism would be a true centrist party, right? And no one would be a part of it because <laughs> what's our following? Well, how do you fight the other guy if you're really in the middle? Like, you know, well, the whole point is not to fight. So, um, But if we look at the 37 factors of enlightenment, as I was saying earlier about oftentimes we're given this sort of dichotomy. These are the things to avoid. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Like there's a list. Rather, Buddhism gives you a list of things to do. Right. So being mindful of the body, being mindful of feeling. What are your practices? Right. It lays out what to do. And the idea is that through doing those things, you naturally avoid things that are not helpful for your practice. Right? So, you know, we had a small quantity of incense before our meditation. So it helps, you know, the space. It helps bring your mind to your practice. But we would not use a scent that is, um, you know, not pleasant because it would throw you off. Right? It would not be helpful. But we don't have to say, don't burn, uh, you know, incense that smells like burning tires and, you know, the junkyard or something, or, you know, the trashy. 
we just naturally burn something that's pleasant, right? It, it, it's sort of just logical. So you don't have to uh, tear down the bad smelling things and say, well, the, the good smelling things are more important. Um, any place that's clean is going to have a pleasing scent or a fresh scent. Uh, if you go to a park and you know out amongst the trees in nature, it will smell fresh, right, and nice, and you have a certain reaction to that. Um, we don't have to say, don't go meditate near the trash heap. It's just naturally where you gravitate. So if you look at the 37 factors of enlightenment, you see a lot of positive practices. And it doesn't have to tell you what the opposite is. You just naturally know. But you'll notice that it has a very sort of positive focus. Like these are things you do do. These are things that are healthy. These are things that are helpful. So it's like going to the doctor and they give you, you know, vitamins and things to support your, you know, your, your health. They don't have to tell you, don't eat poison. You should naturally go, oh, I feel good. So I'm going to gravitate from, you know, things that are not healthy for me. This is natural. Anybody who changes their diet and they start eating more healthy, after about two weeks, they just don't crave the bad food anymore. They don't want as much of it. From time to time, they're like, oh, I want a small slice of cake. But they don't, you don't see them gorging themselves because right? their body has changed. And it doesn't take long, like really two to three weeks. If you eat healthy every day, you'll start to crave healthy food. No one has to tell you, don't eat the bad food. <laughs> you just naturally want more. And you're like, oh, I'll have a salad or I'll have, you know, that healthy thing rather than the, you know, huge bowl of fat that tastes great, but just maybe not good for me. So, um, the last critique the Malakirti makes is not eradicating the afflictions, yet entering into nirvana. Um, how do we understand this? So there's an ultimate truth um, and an unseen things seen and unseen. Um, things that are seen by the enlightened mind and things that are seen the way we see them. So I tried to think of an example um, because this starts to get into a lot of the teaching of the Heart Sutra and emptiness and the Wisdom Sutras, which are, which are not easy initially to just read and pick up. So um, I thought I'd use a modern example, like augmented reality. So um, let's say you've got two people. Um, we're going we're gonna to be in an episode right now of uh, uh, Law and Order. So you've got two police officers, and they've you know, found someone they think did it and they're questioning him. And one of the detectives is just a regular detective and he's looking at the perp. Right? And the other detective has special glasses and the special glasses show the body temperature, the heart rate, the respiration, right? He sees more detail overlaid on the perp. So the first detective asks questions, the guy, I didn't do that. But the second detective can see, oh, his heart rate's going, he's getting warmer, he's got it flushed, you know, he's breathing faster, maybe he's lying. Right? So we often see or think of things kind of from these two perspectives, that there's sort of this provisional truth and this ultimate truth. Um, and we think or feel that one is somehow better than the other, or one is more advantageous than the other, or because somebody has more information, they're seeing a different layer than we are, that they have more depth or wisdom. In fact, the, the Buddhist perspective would be somewhere behind both detectives watching both of them as this happens because both of them are caught up in appearances, <laughs> right? The guy may have an elevated heart rate and he may get flesh just because he's nervous, right? The other guy may not, you know, maybe seeing something else, maybe totally focused on his clothing. Well, if he was, you know, really the person who, who did it would dress this way. And the other guy is just looking at, you know, something else. But both think maybe they have an advantage in their, their observation. And we may say, in fact, you know, neither one really does. They're still caught up on some form, some outward manifestation, and they're not really seeing, you know, what's really happening. To really find out what's happening, you got to maybe ask more questions. Maybe ask the person, you know, where they were, what, what was their motivation? Why, you know, as always is a problem, sometimes you ask, um, you see the manifestation of something, but you don't see the real truth of why you see that manifestation. Maybe he didn't do it, but he did something else and he doesn't want you to know that. <laughs> so he's lying to cover that up. So um, some of the, I think when we get into the concepts of emptiness, they're not easy initially to pick up. It's very difficult to express these ideas in words. Um, 
a lot of it is, uh, as we'll see as we go through the sutra, uh, seemingly paradoxical conversations and um, instruction. But it's paradoxical because it's trying to make your mind more malleable. It's trying to make you get out of just one layer of thinking or that it has to be this way only. So in my example of you know these two police officers, one now has a new way of seeing. And maybe the other feels inadequate because he doesn't have that way of seeing. But it's not actually, you know, if you're only focused on externals, then you're limited to some degree. And that the Buddhist wisdom is really looking at the continuum of factors that go towards that momentary manifestation rather than the guys dressed in a red shirt and blue pants. Right? So, um, but again, something that we have to slowly develop the awareness of. It's not, it's not a, um, very difficult to read it on the page and say, ah, oh, I get it, right? It's something that you have to work with a little bit. So, so you could have some criticism for, um, people and that's what Vimalakirti is doing but in fact his criticism is exhortation it's challenging the students so these are all obviously very advanced students of the Buddha these are not guys that came last week right they've been studying for a long time and so this criticism is a push to get out of a rut and go further into their practice or see things from a different perspective so if um, you find yourself practicing in this way or viewing things from this perspective, then this is our cue that, that we need to go farther. Because these are very common ruts, right? It's very common to you know get to the monastery and say, well, I'm in the special place. And so I must, everything now is going to be okay. That somehow I don't have to do any more work. Um, and Sariputra kind of falls into that. Well, I'm right-hand man. I'm with the Buddha every day. So this enlightenment thing is just going to happen because it will just, you know, ooze off of him, and I'll get it somehow. <laughs> so there's still a push. Um, so the text goes on. At that time, World Honor One, sorry, Putra was saying, at that time, World Honor One, I simply listened to his explanation in silence and was unable to respond. Therefore, I cannot accept your instruction to go inquire about his illness. So is, Vamal, is sorry, Putra just embarrassed? Um, is it something deeper? Was it that he pointed out? You know shortcomings and sorry Putra just feels totally torn apart um, really it's again sorry Putra doesn't feel that he's a good conversation uh, conversationalist in this perspective so his uh, suggestion that I'm, I'm not go or I don't go um, is really asking the Buddha you know there has to be someone who's gonna be better to do this rather than sorry Putra just being embarrassed so next up at bat, right, we get introduced to another of the Buddhist students, uh, Maha Magdalena. So this is one of the Buddhist foremost disciples. He's well known as the disciple whose story inspires the tradition of Ulambana or Obon in Japanese. So uh, Maha Magdalena was considered to be the uh, disciple foremost in spiritual powers. So it's his story of inquiring after his mother's passing and what had happened to her, and then doing, uh, reciting the, the sutras on her behalf and making offerings to the other monks that comes down to us today as memorial services and uh, the Obon service. So this whole tradition starts with this, uh, this particular disciple's personal story. So that's what, he, besides his, his practice, what he's most famous for and most known for. Um, so every year, uh, Buddhist temples do a big service called Obon, and everyone comes together for the practice of um, making offerings and also uh, reciting the sutra on behalf of, uh, for the benefit of the deceased. And one version of the story says that afterwards, uh, Maha Magdalena was so happy to see that his mother was no longer <coughs> trapped in suffering that he danced. So in Japan, that has become the, the uh, bone dance. So after the Obon, there's a big dance festival at a lot of the temples, so that's uh, where you'll see his name more often. So Maha Magdalena addressed the Buddha 
Wold honored one, I dare not accept your instructions to go inquire about his illness. Why? I remember once in the past I had entered the great city of Vaisali and was explaining the Dharma to the retired scholars of a certain neighborhood. At that time, Vimalakirti came and said to me, O oh, Mahamagdaliana, when you explain the Dharma to white-robed retired scholars, you should not explain it as you are doing now. Man, he just shows up everywhere, right? It's totally the wrong time. <laughs> and explain the Dharma, you should explain according to the Dharma. The Dharma is without, is without sentient beings because it transcends the defilements of sentient beings. The Dharma is without self because it transcends the defilements of self. The Dharma is without lifespan because it transcends the birth and death. The Dharma is without person because it eradicates the threshold between previous and subsequent moments. The Dharma is permanently serene because it extinguishes the characteristics. The Dharma transcends characteristics because it is without conditions. The Dharma is without names because it eradicates words. The Dharma is without explanation because it transcends discursive thoughts and reasoning. The Dharma is without the characteristics of form because it is like space. You gotta imagine somebody just showing up while you're trying to give a talk and just, you know, and they just go on and on and on so eloquently and you're just like, oh. <laughs> um, the Dharma is without the sense of personal possession because it transcends personal possession. The Dharma is without discrimination because it transcends the consciousness. The Dharma is incomplete because there is nothing to match it. The Dharma is divorced from causation because it is not located in conditionality. The Dharma is identical to Dharma nature because it in errors in the Dharma. The Dharma accords with suchness because it is without anything that accords with it. The Dharma abides in actual because it is unmoved in the extremes. The Dharma is motionless because it is not dependent on the six types of sensory data. I think this must have been very poetic, right? <laughs> he comes and it's almost like reciting a poem. Otherwise, you could just see Mahamadalyana just going oh. <laughs> more and more. So he goes on. The Dharma concurs with emptiness accords with the absence of characteristics and respects and response to inactivity. The Dharma transcends good and ugly. The Dharma is without gain and loss. The Dharma is without generation and extinction. The Dharma is without refuge. The Dharma surpasses eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. The Dharma is without high and low. The Dharma abides constantly without moving. And the Dharma transcends all practices of contemplation. So, what has Vimalakirti done? Besides, make Mahamangalyana feel this big. <laughs> so he's correcting uh, his manner of teaching. And he's teaching here retired scholars. So these are not... Um, these are smart people, right? So basically you have a group of, you could say, uh, former college professors. And they're sitting around. And so this is a pretty high level... You know, these all these guys have high IQs. They get it. So he's saying at one hand to Mahamantladhyana, you're you're talking down to them, right? You don't know your audience. So what, when you give a talk, what do they say? You know your audience. So who who's the listener? And the listener here has greater capacity than Mahamantladhyana is giving them credit for. So this is the first thing that Vamalakirti points out. That they have the capacity here to really understand this teaching, so give them a deeper teaching. You can kick it up a notch, right? You don't have to give them maybe the common talk that you give on the street when you're begging for alms. You can give them, you know, a graduate school level of discourse and conversation. So that's one. Um, and secondly, he says, these erroneously expounding a teaching that's about their personal salvation when they can understand a teaching that has more to do with Mahayana, right? Saving everyone. So you don't have to tell them, well, the first thing is, you know, what about your suffering? They get it already. They're a much higher level. They're ready for a deeper teaching. So this is Vimalakirti's um, breakdown. So this is why he goes through what is the nature of the Dharma and, and very detailed, right, on and on and on. So I'm not going to go through each one because we could be here forever. But um, this is the essence of the teaching. This is really good advice. You have to know the capacity of the audience. If you don't, you're, give, you're, you're, you're cheapening it, right? You're, you're ripping them off, right? They bought front row tickets, <laughs> and you're giving them a nosebleed experience. So um, it's really looking at what's the capacity, what's suitable for the student. And that's important because if, you're, if it's the opposite, right, and people are new to the teaching and you're talking over their head, well, that's not going to be helpful. But the same rate if, and I've actually heard this from people, 
they've gone to Buddhist lecture and at least from their perspective, they feel like it's too moralistic, right? People may be spending time just saying, don't do this, don't do that, you know, don't drink so much, you know, and they feel it like it's very basic. Um, there is a way to listen to even a teaching that you've heard before with a different ear. Uh, but in general, um, you know, you have to really know who you're talking to. Now, this also brings up kind of maybe a Shingon specific thing, but one of the hallmarks of this school is direct teaching, right? Face to face, um, small group instruction. There's a benefit in tailoring the teaching specifically to each person. Um, so for everybody watching on YouTube, apologies, right? You can't uh, get as much from a video as you can from in person because the teaching is gonna be catered specifically to the listeners. So if I present, I prepare a Dharma talk, I'm thinking about you specifically, right? When I'm doing it. What have we talked about before? What materials have we covered? Um, and so that's a benefit. And then you have the opportunity to ask questions or to go, right? and then I'll change. <laughs> so I have the benefit to see the puzzled face. Right? So there's a benefit to that. Um, so how do you explain the Dharma when your tools are in inadequate? So this is one of the things that Vamalakirti is pointing out. Um, and it's also about what type of mind do we use? Do we use our kind of day-to-day -day mind? And the day-to-day -day mind is always based on the same kind of general fluctuation. We encounter something new and we ask the same questions. Well, is it sort of like this, but it's unlike that. So if it's unlike that, it's more like this, right? We try to categorize it right away based on what we already know. And the Buddhist teaching, if you use that frame of mind, that line of inquiry doesn't work, right? So you're trying to categorize it and it doesn't work in that way. So it's something that transcends the normal kind of scientific method. Well, I assume it's going to be this way. I'm going to do these tests. I'm going to find it doesn't match that. So then it must fall into this category. And as soon as we categorize it, it breaks through the mold of categorization. So I did this when I was younger. I first came to Buddhism and I was like, well, it's got to be like this. Well, I think I know this. I can see where this text is going. And then I turned the page and it would be off in a different direction. I'm like, oh, well, then it must be like that. And then it's back over here. So there's this constant um, surprise. So we have to read it as um, with a little bit more broader mindedness. So you may think, for example, we're, we're on an astrological theme tonight, so I'll use another astrological example. Um, a lot of astrological discoveries are made not because it's something that's seen but because they see something else manifested so they see a star that has an unusual wobble or a planet that has an unusual orbit so they say there has to be something in the middle that's dark that we can't see with the telescope that's affecting this orbit right so i have these clues so i postulate there is something else that works to a point with the buddhist teaching but a lot of the unknown is unknown inside of us so we're constantly discovering um, we're constantly uncovering, but what Vimalakirti is pointing out too is that the Dharma itself is unconditioned. There is nothing that it is making and nothing that is made from. So we're using the wrong tools to analyze it. And initially, that's hard to wrap our mind around because it's a totally different type of thinking than what we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's sometimes where things become frustrating. And this is Vamalakirti's sort of exhortation um, to Mahamadvalyana to not use that same type of rationale with this group, that this group of scholars can handle it. You can throw them a more difficult mental puzzle and they'll pick it up. So we're saying we're looking for something beyond conditions, marks, and manifestations, right? What happens when we strip away all of the uh, symbols, right? all the layers, all the label labels, what do you get? You get pure experience. What is that like? We'll have to ask an infant, right? Because they're purely experiencing life all the time. They have no, they're not making 
Well, today's bottle was different from yesterday's bottle because I, I detect a slight nuance of, no, they don't do that. <laughs> Just give me the bottle. <laughs> so, but we do, right? So we make some of these distinctions and that, that creates problems. Um, so what is it like? It's, you meet someone who's been in darkness forever, right? So it actually gives the, uh, this Omaha Magliana, with characteristics such as these, how can the Dharma be explained? Explaining the Dharma should be without explaining and without indicating. He goes on. Listening to the Dharma should be without listening and without attaining. It is like a magician explaining the Dharma to conjured people. Mm, I really like that. So what is it like? So we'll use a little bit of, you know, Plato in the cave, shadows on the wall. Um, it's like going into the darkness, people who've always been in darkness, and explaining to them what light is. They have no way to understand, right? They have to experience it. You can lead them, right? If you go left 40 feet, and then right, and then up the stairs, and you fall on the wall, you'll come into the light. But I can't explain to you what the light is. You have to... So all the Buddha's teaching is, in many ways, is how do you get there yourself, right? So it can't ever, in words, explain to you the experience. And that's part of Malakirti's uh, exhortation to Mahamantulayana, that the way you're explaining it is cheapening the Dharma. Right? So don't, don't do that. So of course, Mahamantulayana says to the Buddha, I can't go either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're in there for this evening. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, so of course, We'll see some of you Sunday. We we'll do it, um, and otherwise we'll be back again, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, back here on Thursday. So I'll have your gasho keys. We'll do the dedication of merit, the echo. So the last, the last statement on the, the paper. So this um, again using the same imagery of the uh, full moon. The full moon doesn't uh, distinguish who it's going to shine its light on. Everybody around the world was posting pictures of the beauty on uh, social media. So I get to see it from a variety of different uh, parts of the world, uh, thanks to friends all around the world, so that was nice. So in the same way, uh, when we dedicate our merit, um, we think of, of everyone equally. 